Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning. Thank you for joining us in our worship, whether you're locally, part of our church community here in Tewkesbury, or further afield, or joining us on the telephone line. You are very welcome. Thank you for coming together and worshipping the Lord this morning. Our theme today, as we continue our journey through St. Luke's Gospel, is Strength to Love. Uh, And I took that title from a book by Martin Luther King, Uh, when he was writing about the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And Andrew Simpkins is going to be speaking to us today on the passage from St. Luke's Gospel about loving our enemies and learning to forgive them. So we look forward to that. Just want to say a very big thank you to Dave and Karen Greenwood for our quiz again last night. They're such good fun and we really enjoyed it. So thank you for all your hard work. It's been a real blessing during these different lockdowns to have Something to look forward to and join in together, so thank you. And today is the first Sunday in Lent, and I hope you've been able to find something to do during Lent. I think we've all given up too much, so it's a good (laughs) idea to take something up during this Lent. It's about just intentionally spending time with God. So it's not too late. Um, Stephen put out lots of ideas on his email, so do have a look at that and find something to do during this season of Lent. Absolutely. It's a great thing, great season of life just to reflect and prepare ourselves for the joy of Easter. And of course, last Tuesday was Shrove Tuesday, Pancake Day. Um, So if you've taken a video uh, of yourself or or your family members flipping pancakes, uh, Lucy's put that all together and that'll be on the YouTube site uh, from about 12 o'clock today. So do have a look at that and uh, enjoy watching one another flipping our pancakes. (laughs) Or not. Or not, as the case may be. (laughs) Now, As we come to worship this morning, it's important that we give thanks to God for all his goodness to us, you know, and sometimes we can really find it hard to be thankful, can't we? The the whole area of gratitude in our lives when life is a struggle and we're going through tremendous challenges or bereavements or difficulties, it can be really hard to be thankful to God. But we need to remember, friends, that God has given us so much. He promises us so much. and We need to hold fast to those promises that endure for all eternity, not just for this life. And so we give thanks to him. We focus our heart, our eyes, our attention on Jesus and thank him for his saving love for us and the forgiveness he offers us from his death on the cross and his resurrection to life. So as we come together to worship this morning, I'd like to encourage you to turn your hearts to him and to be thankful. And I'm just going to read some words from Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your hearts and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Mm. That includes us. Mm. He is faithful. So let's just pause for a moment and invite him to be present with us in our worship this morning and allow his spirit to well up within us with hearts of gratitude and thankfulness to God for his gracious mercy and his loving kindness. And let's sing together this great hymn of praise. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty King of creation. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul. 
together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for so much that you bless our lives with. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be with us, whether we're going through the good times or the bad. You have promised to be with us every step of the way. Mm. And Lord, we want to worship you this morning as we come together as your family, your church, We want to lift our hearts to you, to worship you, to thank you, to welcome you into our lives afresh. May you come by your Holy Spirit, work out your purposes in each one of us as we live to your glory and to your praise. Amen. Amen. I mentioned the quiz uh, last night, and if you were watching that, you will have seen we had a little clip of Simon Ponsonby's story of faith and how he came from being a a butcher in Bristol to um, a theologian and a pastor. And we're going to see a little bit more of uh, Simon's um, testimony today. Um, Both clips will be on our YouTube channel later on, so you can go back and have a look at those. But Stephen was able to ask um, Simon some questions about the future for the church. So have a look at this. And we've been uh, inspired by your thoughts on prayer that, that we've been watching over the last uh, four weeks. Uh, and uh, I've posted them onto our church Facebook page and people have loved them. We've had a week of prayer. Uh, we're running a prayer course during Lent, Pete Gregg's prayer course. Uh, so that's been a really uh, kind of significant season for us as a church. And I just appreciate your thoughts on Uh, what we should be focusing on as a church as we emerge from lockdown and this whole impact of this last year of the coronavirus on the church. How do you think we should be kind of focusing our energies at this time? Well, that's a really good question. And uh, I'm not sure I have got a clear (laughs) schematic of quite what to do when we emerge from lockdown. Thank God that that we, we, it looks like we will be doing so soon with the rollout of the vaccines. Um, I think two things. First, we've got to focus on the things that we lost in lockdown. And um, in lockdown, it really, despite all the, the, the blessings of technology and online connections with Zoom and online church, we lost community and um, I think we, we, we're going to need to work quite hard rebuilding community um, and family and the sense of the body and you know we've, we've all been we've all been sort of in one sense quite consumer unless you're you know a clergy person and part of the team putting on the putting on these events we we've been in our homes watching and consuming but I think we um, we're going to need to work as church leaders and as church on doing family again doing community doing unity being a body and uh, learning what it is to do church together not just watching it in our isolated sort of homes on on laptop Um, and I think along with that people after a year of watching online are not used to being together they may enjoy and prefer not being together um they may have they may much prefer the the input down the screen and watching and do church from their bed or their pajamas or 
you know, all of that. And so, so I think, I think the question will be whether we continue to have some sort of online presence as well as in-person gathering and, and how we divide our time, resources and energy. That would be the first thing. Um, and I think also some people fear, are going to be full of fear about meeting. Um, a lot of people will have suffered loss or suffered in health wise. So I think, I think a lot of pastoring is going to be going on, building family and pastoring. That's what I think we, we initially look forward to and yeah. invest in. Yeah. Gathering the family and stirring them up and encouraging one another. Yeah. And uh, tending one another before we then look out in our in mission and vision. Uh, and as you look at the, 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 the wider landscape of the church across this nation, uh, you, you've mentioned in, in some of your talks about the declining numbers in the Church of England, particularly the financial crisis, or all these kind of uh, discouraging aspects um, that, that seem to uh, come our way at this time, um, accelerated by the pandemic and its impact on the church. What what hope do you have for the church across the nation um, looking forward beyond this uh, rather difficult season we're in now? Oh, yeah, what hope. Again, I, I was talking earlier about that book I've been reading about hope and I'm reading her this morning. I'm reading my Bible as well in the morning, but I also am reading a bit of her. And today she she was talking about hope. She's an atheist, but saying that she was living with hope. And I thought, wow, this atheist has got hope for tomorrow, for the future plans. And, uh, but we're the hope people, you know, we could bottle it because actually we've got every basis to, to have strong hope. And I think firstly, we, we hope because God hasn't left us. We, we, we left the building, but he hasn't left the church. And um, God is here and uh, he promises to be with us always. So, you know, wherever we are and however we are, when we come back to church and we rethink the future, God is here. He hadn't given up on us. He hasn't given up on our country, hadn't given up on the church, hasn't given up on the lost. And uh, I think we just need to sort of re, you know, find that true north again. God is with us. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That puts everything in order. And then I think, secondly, things are in a mess. And the church has been um, hemorrhaging for some time numbers. Um, but I think that this pandemic has caused people you know, it has brought fear to the front door. And um, I think that, you know, we've got the answer for that. I think it's caused real hunger in people and real questions to rise up about life and, you know, existential questions as well as political and, and whatever. And we, we've got something to say. We've got a grand narrative, uh, a beautiful grand narrative. We got, we've got something to say. We've got something to offer and we shouldn't be ashamed. And I think that we should, you know, pray and push to find opportunities where we can say God is here and we've got a story and, and something for you. I think, um, I think the church is just looking inwards at the church. We've been humbled in this, in these, in this season. We kept going though. And, um, it's been a bit like a desert, hasn't it, really? Lent, we're coming into Lent, and I often think about Lent in terms of the, the desert. But there's a lovely, uh, lovely phrase in the Song of Songs, who's this coming up out of the desert, leaning on their beloved? And I think we're coming out of the desert, leaning on our beloved, and he's with us, and we're coming with him. And Jesus came out of the desert, it says, in the power of the Spirit. I hope that we'll be a humbler, we'll be leaner, but we're more fit for purpose, leaning on our, on our beloved and in the power of the Spirit. That sounds great. That, that really yeah. does give hope, doesn't it? That's a, that's a lovely uh, tone to finish on. I think that 
uh, that missional intention and missional opportunity. Yeah, that's that's what I, that's what I, you know, when 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 uh, you said you wanted to uh, ask, I thought that's what I thought. Come out the desert, leaning on the beloved. So he's there with us, but also come out in his power. We might be limping, but we got some power because he's with us. And there's a job to be done, and the Lord trusts us with it. It was lovely to have the opportunity to speak to Simon earlier this week. And I love what he said about the church emerging from this season, humbler, leaner, and more fitter for purpose. Uh, And I I think there's some great things we can take away from uh, his insights there. Uh, And particularly in this time of Lent, and we think about Jesus in the wilderness, and how he thought about the church coming out of the wilderness of this pandemic, uh, leaning on the beloved, that, that image from the Song of Solomon. So I encourage you just to reflect on some of those things as we think about how we as a church community uh, will emerge into the recovery phase uh, in the coming months. We're now going to turn to our intercessions and Julie Jarman's going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we thank you for your life-giving word, your written word and the word made alive in Jesus, who came to live among us and show us your love. Holy Spirit, settle our hearts and minds now as we come to you with our prayers and petitions, resting in the knowledge that our Father loves to hear the prayers of his children. And thank you that even now your Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. Your word brings peace and calm, just as the disciples found when they were in the midst of a raging storm. Jesus, we pray for all those now who feel as though they are in an uncontrollable storm. Jesus, at your word, the wind and the waves obey you. Please bring that peace that only you can bring to all who are experiencing fear or distress in these very difficult times. Your word brings guidance. You are a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. We pray for all those in government, both in our country and worldwide, that you would guide leaders to make decisions that are just and fair, motivated by compassion and respect for all human beings. We pray for all those seeking your direction for their life. And thank you that you promise to guide us in the way of wisdom. Your word brings forgiveness, and through that, new life, just as you forgave the thief on the cross. Please bring to mind anyone whom we have held in unforgiveness. Help us to choose the path of forgiveness, and through that, find that we re-establish close relationship with you. We pray for warring factions throughout the world, that you would raise up people who lead by example of forgiveness and acceptance of others, despite their actions and differences. Your word brings provision, just as at the feeding of the 5,000. Lord, we ask that you will provide for the people of Moldova in their desperate need for a COVID vaccine. Lord, we offer you our mustard seed of faith and ask you to move the mountain. We ask for physical protection for Pastor Yuri as he visits people's homes to bring the gospel to them. And we thank you for the technology that enables Wayne O'Leary, our mission partner, to continue teaching online through the Slavic Gospel Association. We pray that you will carry your message powerfully through this medium to the very centre of the communities that you want to reach. Your word brings healing and life, physically, emotionally and spiritually. You healed many diseases You showed unconditional love and acceptance again and again. Your love knows no end. Your faithfulness knows no limits. Right now we picture before you all those we know and love who really need to know that loving kindness, strength and enduring comfort and peace that comes from being held in your arms. 
As many of us embark on the prayer course this week, we ask that you will stir up a hunger and thirst to know you more and to find new ways of speaking and listening to you. We thank you that Jesus, the Word made flesh, gave us actual words to pray to our Heavenly Father. And we share those now by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Thank you, Julie, for your intercessions this morning. And we're going to turn now to our reading, and Nicole is going to bring that to us, followed by Andrew Simpkins with his message this morning. Luke 6, verse 27 to 38. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured to you this is the word of the lord thanks be to god oh, good morning everyone so uh we're in this passage in luke 6 this morning where jesus says these very famous um and quite distinctive words of love your enemies. Love your enemies. So I wonder if you're all watching and listening this morning, do you have any enemies? It's, it's not particularly nice to think that we've got enemies, is it? You'd like to think that as a good Christian, you, you wouldn't have any enemies. Unfortunately, we don't live in a country where being persecuted and have obvious enemies so how do we relate to this saying love your enemies well we may not consciously have enemies but we will all have experienced conflict with other people we can experience conflict in marriage we experience conflict at times in our families with our children No doubt we've all experienced conflicting situations in work. And yes, conflicts happen in churches. There's a great tendency to uh, avoid conflict, isn't there? We don't like conflict. So you have strategies of coping, like denying it, uh, suppressing it, evading it. Um, they don't tend to work very well, those strategies, do they, in the long run, because the conflict doesn't go away. It only tends to go away when we take that courage to have a conversation with somebody. But as I, as I thought about this passage and what to speak on, the, the, the thought that struck me was that before we can love our enemies or love somebody that we feel in conflict with or someone who is upsetting us or distressing us, we have to forgive them. That forgiveness is a precondition for loving our enemies. So I wanted to say actually something about forgiveness this morning. Um... Because in life, times will arise where we get hurt. Times will arise where someone does some harm to us, whether emotional or or physical. And 
understanding our need to forgive is such a central part of Christian faith. And I'd like to kind of illustrate this by quite a a personal story. Um, When I was still quite a young Christian, I was in a church where a leader said something that was quite hurtful to me. So this, uh, this experience didn't really come to me with a, with a full awareness of, of, of what had happened. But in the days and weeks that followed, I, I, I just felt there was something wrong. There was something wrong. That, there was something wrong in my, in my spiritual life. But I, I didn't really understand what it was, that this thing that just seemed to be troubling me inside. And I Remember, that was a time where we went to Spring Harvest as a church, and one morning I went to a seminar. I can't remember what this seminar was about. I think the topic was irrelevant. I remember sitting in this seminar and just starting to weep, which, which was quite embarrassing. Fortunately, there was nobody I knew around me. <laughs> but I started weeping, and I, I, I can only say I just felt an agony. It's, it's not wrong to use such a strong word. I just felt an agony in my heart. And I remember kind of calling out to the Lord and saying, Lord, what is the matter? I don't understand what is the matter. What is wrong with me? And I didn't, I didn't get an instant answer to that prayer. And another couple of weeks went past. And after church one Sunday morning, a friend came up to me and just said, Andrew, I just feel the Lord wants me to give you this book. And he gave me a book. It was by, remember, it's by an American guy called Charles Swindle. And I, so I took it home and I opened it and I read the first chapter. And it was a reflection on the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, you, uh, many of you will know this parable from Matthew 18. You know, the king calls his servants to account. There's one servant who owes him a colossal sum of money. Jesus uses this huge figure, you know, like a billion pounds. And the king forgives this servant. But then the servant goes out and and grabs the fellow servant by the throat who owes him 20 quid. And because he can't pay up, he has the guy thrown into prison. So the other servants are really and understandably distressed by this. So they go and tell the king. So the king calls in this servant and says, I forgave you this vast debt and you failed to forgive your fellow servant. And then, and this is why this is one of the scary parables, He goes on, so the king had him put in jail with the torturers until he should forgive. And then Jesus says, and so shall my heavenly father do to you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, you read this particular parable and you think, but God is a God of love. How could he possibly say to somebody, you will be in prison with the torturers. But when I read it that day, that was exactly what I felt. I felt that agony that I felt inside was like being tortured. And I thought, oh, I see what God is saying to me. He is saying to me, Andrew, the problem is you are holding unforgiveness towards that person. You are holding unforgiveness, and that is why you had that agony inside you. It's, it's been said, hasn't it, that holding unforgiveness towards another person is like drinking poison but hoping the other one will die. But the poison destroys you. The poison destroys you. So I I remember kneeling down and as best as I was able, sincerely repenting about it. And of course, after I'd done that, uh, my soul was at peace. But that so taught me a lesson about the importance, the absolute importance before God 
of forgiving. As Jesus says later in that passage, forgive and you shall be forgiven. And friends, you know, every Sunday morning in the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. And Jesus meant it when he asked us to pray those words. Lord, yes, forgive us, but we understand it's as we also forgive. In that sense, forgiveness is not unconditional. It's unconditional in the sense that God forgives us all the wrong and stupid and false things that we've done. His forgiveness is unconditional in that sense, but it's not unconditional in the sense that we can then go on and hold our grudges and resentments. It's not unconditional in that sense. If we have truly known the grace of God that has freely forgiven us, that has melted our hearts, that has moved us to tears, that has set our hearts free, if we've truly known that, we have to show that grace to other people. That's what God expects. Now, forgiveness... It's important to, 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 to have a, a right understanding of forgiveness because sometimes I think people can misunderstand something about the nature of forgiveness and that hinders them from forgiving. So I just want to briefly touch on two, two things here which I think are important to say about forgiveness. Um, but you know, Forgiveness is a letting go. Forgiveness is a release of another person. Forgiveness is leaving something behind in the past. It only takes one person to forgive you. We don't need another person's involvement to forgive them. It just takes one. That's why you can actually forgive somebody who's died. Because they don't need to know. You can forgive. You can choose to forgive. But forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation, another biblical word. Reconciliation is not about the past, it's about the present. And reconciliation is about two people, not one person. To achieve reconciliation, you have to sit down with the person and explain what has happened and tell them that you have forgiven them and they then have to receive that. And accept that. Perhaps they apologise and say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really understand the consequences of what I did there. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, I hope we can be friends. And then you say, well, I hope we can be friends too. Well, let's be friends again. And, you, and together you have achieved a reconciliation, which is a wonderful thing. But sometimes you have to forgive somebody without presuming that reconciliation will be possible, because that in part depends on the other person, not just on you. You understand? Sometimes the other person isn't willing to be reconciled. And you may have to bear that, but it doesn't prevent you forgiving them. It just means that the relationship cannot yet be fully restored. And I think a second thing is, particularly where people have suffered from another person's I suppose behaviour to which we normally nowadays apply words like abusive or addictive, where where you have suffered because of somebody with an an abusive or addictive behaviour, you can forgive them. And you may even be able to sit down with them and have a conversation where they may apologise and say sorry and, and promise to do better in the future. But wisdom tells you that It may just be words, and they may not change. And therefore, it's perfectly okay for you to withhold trust from that person. You're not being asked to make yourself vulnerable to someone whose behavior you know you cannot yet trust. But again, it doesn't mean that you can't forgive them. It means that you just have to walk in wisdom 
and encourage them and help them as best as you can to address the behavior that has caused the hurt or the harm. So Jesus, in this passage, is encouraging us to lay aside all hostility that we feel towards another person. And and we have to examine our own hearts. And you will know if you look in your heart if you've got hostile feelings towards somebody. You you will know it. You You will know it. I hope you haven't. But if you have, you will know it. And Jesus is encouraging us to lay aside that hostility and the thoughts of revenge and retaliation and resentment that so easily just cluster around it and kind of hold us captive. But the wonderful thing to leave you with in this passage is where uh, he says this, um, that he... you. He wants us to become sons of the Most High, who is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So what Jesus is saying here is, you can be like your Father in heaven if you are merciful, if you forgive. You you can be... You can be like God. There's actually a saying, isn't there? To err is human, to forgive divine. That is true. That is true. So isn't isn't this an amazing thing that when we forgive, when we show mercy, we, as it were, partake of something of the divine nature. We become more like Christ. We become more like God. Isn't that, a, isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a wonderful thing? And that is the glory of forgiveness, that we are doing something that, as it were, it was God's great prerogative towards us and that we can participate in, in our own lives. So be willing to forgive the unkind and the ungrateful, <laughs> as God does knowing that you too have been unkind and ungrateful at times. But as we forgive and release, more of that character of Christ will be visible and evident in our lives. May we walk in that. May we all live in that together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, for your message to us today. It is such a challenge, isn't it, to know how to forgive and to put that into practice in our lives, particularly those who've who've really hurt us and done some damage to us. And sometimes the hardest person to forgive can be ourselves. And that's where we really need God's grace to help us let ourselves off the hook. It reminds me of the story Corrie Ten Boom told when she had been released from Ravensbrook Prison after the Second World War, where she had been interned. And she was at a church service and came across one of the Nazi prison guards. Um, And she remembered the awful things this prison guard had done. And she really wrestled in her heart to know how she could forgive this man as he held out his hand towards her in a greeting. He had since become a Christian. And what she found impossible to do by herself, she found that God gave her the strength to do it and to release forgiveness to him. And that, in turn, let herself free from any feelings of bitterness or resentment. It's a really good lesson to learn and something we have to, all of us, take on board when we feel that struggle with that whole area of forgiveness. So I encourage you to reflect on that today and to ask the Lord to help you put that into practice in your life. We're going to turn to our final song today, which is Waymaker. And it it talks about who God is and how he can make a way when there seems to be no other way. Let's sing this together. Thank you.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. I know for some of you that's one of your uh, favourite modern songs that you've told me so, uh, so I hope you enjoyed singing that. Some lovely descriptions of who God is, a waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Um, we pray that God would make those characteristics real to us in our faith and in our walk with him day by day. As we draw to the end of our service this morning then, will you join me as we pray for God's blessing upon us. Lord, we thank you that you are all those things of which we have just sung. And we thank you, Lord, that because of the death of Jesus on the cross, we have been forgiven all our sins that we've ever committed and will ever commit in the future. We just need to turn to you in repentance and receive that forgiveness. And we thank you for the gift of life you offer to us. And pray this morning, Lord, that you will help us to set other people free and set ourselves free from any enduring resentment or bitterness that may rest upon our hearts because of the hurt that has been done to us. May we indeed put the words of the Lord's Prayer into practice. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon each one of you this day and those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of our service this morning. Uh, Thank you for joining Mm. us as we continue on this journey through Lent. I hope that you are able to make room in your lives, your busy lives, to be intentional in your relationship with God and just have that time with him. Even if it's going out for a daily walk and spending some time in prayer, just make something of this season so we can go deep in our faith. Have a great week and may the Lord bless you. keep up to date with what's going on on our YouTube channel, please click the subscribe button and if you also click the bell, you'll be notified when a new video is posted. God bless and let's stay connected.